Ed. Uh, I've worked with a few internal vets at exclusively equine, and my sessions, unlike most practitioners, are about two hours long, which sounds intensive, but the first half an hour we focus on the equine assessment portion. So that's when I look at, um, oh, hang on, webinar, change slides, yes. Okay, so I look closely at the way your horse stands and his posture. I look at the muscle development, checking for asymmetries or um, where he's more developed on one side of the body and less developed on the other. And then I watch your horse move in hand. Um, so I'm looking at where he puts his feet, um, whether he's on two tracks. So some things that you might like to consider about your own horses. Does your horse always stand with the same foot forward? Are his muscles even and symmetrical when he's standing up square? Does he move with his limbs on two tracks? Does he drag his toes? Sometimes you can see uh, squared off toes on the hind feet and that's um, a bit of an indication if your farrier hasn't squared off the toes on purpose that can be an indication that your horse is reluctant to pick up the hind leg, engage the hock and stifle and flex properly to bring the leg forward and he's actually just dragging his toes along the ground and that's what's squaring them off. Um, does he drop or hike a hip? Is there a, a head bob? Does he have the same stride length on all four limbs? What's his proprioception like? So does he know where his limbs are in space? Does he um, step wide on some steps or is he base narrow? Uh, does he step under himself properly on a circle? So when horses are circling, they should take their inside hind limb and put it behind their offside fore and really take their body weight underneath themselves to cross properly. And if they're having troubles with that, quite often they'll go around on two tracks on a circle. And I also watch them back up. So does he back cleanly in a nice straight line, picking up all four feet with even strides, or does he step back uh, a bigger step with one leg more than the other, which means he slowly turn in a circle, or does he drag his toes when he backs up? Um, so we assess how the horse stands, uh, their posture, their muscle development, and how they move, because that can tell me a lot about whatever is going on inside the horse's body. So uh, looking at some photos, these are some pictures of clients of mine. The horse on the left and in the middle, the chestnut, that's the same horse. And you'll notice that his posture, his stance, isn't correct. So he's not standing square and he's not evenly weight bearing on all four limbs. The way he's standing with his hinds in line on a third track in between his two front feet um, often, often indicates pelvic discomfort. So if he were comfortable in the hind end, he would have no problem standing with his legs directly underneath his hip joint. Uh, but he's trying to get his weight underneath his body um, because he's got some weakness in the hind and so he's more comfortable to stand with them straight in line. You might notice if you look at humans, I do it myself, If like I have a dodgy right knee and so I'll quite often stand with all my weight on my left leg um, to spare my right knee. So it's a similar similar instance here. Um, but then the problem of that is that now I have pain in my left hip because I'm compensating for my right knee and horses are working exactly the same way. Um, so this guy, because he's standing with his hind legs in a line, he's on three tracks and he has more weight than he should have on his front legs trying to take the weight off his compromised hind end. So horses naturally have 67% of weight, or thereabouts, I'm not being particular, <laughs> uh, on their front limbs. Um, and then when you add a rider on their back, it changes their centre of gravity and we ask them to engage the, the big muscles in their hind quarters, which is the driving muscles. So we're asking them to shift their centre of gravity back, shift the weight off their forelimbs onto their hind limbs, when naturally they're not built that way. Naturally they're built to carry more weight on their front limbs. So through riding, we're asking them to put more pressure through their hind limbs and if the pelvis is compromised, for example, if they were raced at a young age uh, before the growth plates have closed, if they're, uh, for example, 18-month-old, two-year-old horses that are going in the same direction over and over before the growth plates in the pelvis have fused, quite often results in pelvic injury or pelvic discomfort. Um, and if that's the case, oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh no, <laughs> where was I going with that noise? <laughs> One track mind. 
oh, compensator, they get the one track. Yes, that's right. We're talking about compensator. Yes. So repetitive things, we get compensations in the body, and then we get postures that are abnormal because the horse is trying to ease the issues, the pain that it's feeling, particularly through the pelvis. In the case of the guy on the left. Um, and then also they're trying to get the weight off the back end and onto the front end, which goes against what we try to do when we ride them. We want them to put their weight on the hind end. Okay, um, so a lot about the horse's body and the way of going can be seen in the hooves as well. As a, a bodywork therapist, quite often what I see upstairs the far in the muscles and soft tissues, the farrier can see downstairs in the wear of the hoof. Um, and vice versa. So the farrier will say to me, oh, I've got a horse that's wearing the lateral aspect of its hoof, um, outside edge of its hoof. And I'll say, yeah, that's funny. It's got problems in its hip joint. Um, when I work on the muscles around the, around the hind end, it's quite sensitive over the hip joint. Um, so the photo on the right there is of said horse with hip issues. And uh, you can see the way the, the hoof has worn down on the right hand side, uh, how the heel length is different to that on the left side and the, the hoof is actually on an angle. If you draw a straight line across the heel bulbs, across here, it's not the same line as what's across the plane of the hoof. So the, ideally we want the plane of the hoof and the heel bulbs to be level, parallel, um, because that indicates that we've got even hoof growth all the way around, um, and in the case of this photo, the horse isn't. So it was essentially walking bow-legged and wearing down the outside edges of its hooves to try to take the pressure off its hip joint and its pelvis, but it, that then put pressure into the stifles and the hocks, making it quite sore, and fetlocks too, making it quite sore through the rest of the limb. Um, so. It's pretty important for your body worker to work with other professionals working on your horse, like the vet, the dentist, your trainer, your coach, and especially the farrier. Um, when the body worker has as much information from as many professionals as possible, then it's a team approach to really put the pieces together of what's happening in your horse's body and then form a plan to rehabilitate your horse and help him um, develop strength and be happy um, under saddle because we don't like riding cranky horses that rear and buck, but also just to feel good in himself. So, um, yeah, I think that's everything. I've got notes and I'm so excited, I'm skipping ahead. <laughs> so, muscle development tells us a lot about the horse's way of going and it also indicates areas of issue and discomfort. So the photo of the mare on the left has a Sweeney shoulder. This is significant muscle atrophy over the scapula, um, infraspinatus and supraspinatus, which is caused by, in this particular photo, it's caused by a combination of nerve trauma and disuse. So this mare fell in a floating accident and had a nerve impingement of the suprascapular nerve, and that nerve provided um, blood flow and uh, use uh, brain pings to those muscles sitting over the scapula. And then when that nerve was severed or damaged, uh, the muscles weren't used properly and they weren't functioning and so that's why we've got that wastage that you can see. The bit straight down the middle, thanks Louise, she's using the mouse for me. This is the spine of scapula. So that's a bony landmark that a lot of therapists feel for when they're working over the shoulders. And you can quite clearly see the atrophy on either side. Um, at the top of the scapula, there's scapular cartilage and saddle fit is, re is really important because if your saddle is sitting too far forward or if your saddle doesn't fit your horse, it can damage the scapular cartilage up the top here. So the withers are spinous processes and they're a lot firmer because they're bone, but then below that is scapular cartilage which is cartilage and therefore a lot softer and it's a lot easier to damage. So that's why saddle fit is quite important in regards to the shoulders. Also, this horse is standing with her front legs square and you can see where the scapula cartilage sits. But if the horse is trotting and the leg comes forward, that sc scapula cartilage moves back further along the back. So we need to allow room under our saddle for that range of motion of the scapula to move as the horse moves its limb forwards and backwards. 
Um, so back to Sweeney's shoulder, I digressed into saddle fit, apologies for that. <laughs> uh, so um, with this mare we used TENS therapy which is a, a little electric uh, stimulation, a little electrical pulse that goes into the muscle and causes contraction and relaxation um, and that's really good for getting blood flow and circulation into the area and drawing the horse's attention to those muscles and showing how to use those muscles again. Um, we used deep tissue massage to improve blood flow. We did a lot of stretching exercises with her. We also used kinesiology tape to um, direct feel to the area. So I would tape her to encourage her to use particular muscles but not use others. Um, and this photo was taken when she first came into care and she's doing quite well now. The nerve damage unfortunately was permanent but we've got a lot more condition and definition to the muscles surrounding the scapula, so through the chest, the shoulders, um, up around the top of the shoulder, the triceps down lower in, uh, in the shoulder of the limb. Uh, yep, triceps down here, <laughs> yeah, and we, we've got a bit more definition around the chest and we've also got some more definition up around the top of the scapula there through the traps. So through the therapy, um, mixed results. The nerve damage appears to be permanent, so we haven't been able to get full muscle condition back to the shoulder, but we have managed to improve the muscles surrounding the area to better support the shoulder. Um, the middle photo, this is the hind end of a brood bear. So looking at muscle development, we can see she's higher on the left higher on the right side than she is on the left side. Her spine isn't centered, it's tilted to the left a touch. Her right tubercoxy of the pelvis is significantly higher than the left tubercoxy of the pelvis. So her pelvis is tilted down to the left. Um, looking at her muscle development, she's more developed through the left semimembranosus and semitendinosus, the hamstrings, than what she is through the right. Um, She's also a lot more developed down lower through gastrocnemius than what she is on the right hand side. So she's quite uneven um, looking at muscle development but also looking at her bony landmarks as well of her pelvis. Um, and then looking at the grey on the right, he's good fun. Love to know what's going on there. <laughs> Maybe Louise can offer a diagnosis somewhere down the line. Um, he has crushed withers. Um, and so I can actually fit my hand in where Louise is pointing the mouse and from the side you can't see my hand at all. There's like a, a big hollow there. Um, either side of the withers he should have even scapulars, even shoulders, but you can see the right one is horrifically more developed than the left. So he's really uneven over the shoulders. This horse was to be ridden, was to be used as a ridden horse but finding a saddle to comfortably fit him with this sort of trauma was proving to be impossible. So he's got uh, a bit of muscle wastage through the left shoulder, a lot of muscle development, so atrophy and hypertrophy through the right shoulder, and then he's also got a fairly significant injury to the spinous processes of the withers. Um, okay, what else is in my notes that I haven't mentioned? Oh yes, so with this guy, the grey, his right shoulder and therefore the entire forelimb looked like it had been shunted forward about a centimetre. So um, it's uh, tough to say but I would assume it would be likely through trauma but that the trauma that he's suffered to the withers or the scapula has had a flow on effect through the entire limb so his shoulder is quite crunchy. He's fairly old and I, I assume osteoarthritis. Um, his knees are not level and his hoof development is not correct. Um, so that if the horse can't move the limb correctly then he has to compensate by using other muscles and that's what causes the atrophy and the hypertrophy and he also has to take the weight of the right, the ill functioning right limb onto the left limb so then you start getting um, issues with the left limb. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to the next slide. Ah, so this is a hunter's bump on the left, which I see a lot of. So this hunter's bump, um, it, it's called such because it used to be desirable in show jumpers, but research has proven that it's actually um, trauma to the pelvis 
uh, affecting the sacroiliac joints. The sacroiliac joints are hair-like fibrous ligaments that attach the pelvis to the spine. So there really shouldn't be a lot of movement between these, these ligaments. The, the pelvis should have a, a limited range of motion with the spine, but through trauma or poor riding or just asking the horse to do too much too soon, these ligaments can stretch, um, the pelvis can rotate left or right or forwards or backwards and then you get um, muscle atrophy and wastage around that area and that's what produces what we can see there, the little hunter's bump. So <clears throat> along with this sacroiliac issue. We've also got overdeveloped hamstrings down the back of the leg, uh, biceps femoris, semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and we're lacking through the gluteals and the quadriceps group. So when this horse walks, he's using his hamstrings to drag the leg forward, um, which we can also see in the squaring off of the toe and the lack of flexion through the stifle, hip, stifle and hock. Um, whereas ideal movement would be using the muscles of the gluteals and the quadriceps to pick the leg up cleanly and place it forward behind left hind. Um, so this guy has actually come a long way. We've done quite a lot of work with him and we've evened up the, the muscle tone. We've, we've developed his quads and his glutes. We've uh, tried to encourage him not to overuse his hamstrings. He's softened a lot through the back and his hunter's bump is now fairly visible, which is fantastic. Um, I should have done before and afters. Yes. Oh. I love yeah, I should have done before and afters. Okay, so um, the middle photo, this is a cap talk and this is just to uh, reiterate that trauma causes significant body issues. So with the cap talk, we've got compromised flexor tendons and extensor tendons, uh, which help to move the foot. And then on the, the photo on the right, we've got a significant scar tissue, significant injury with a lot of scar tissue. There's muscle atrophy through there. There's muscle hypertrophy through there. Um, so we've got um, around the scar, we've got muscle atrophy where it's wasted away. And then below through the pec muscles, we've got muscle hypertrophy where the muscle's been overused to compensate. So this horse, as a result of this injury, had compromised movement posture and body use. Yeah. Okay. So assessment, we look at movement where we're identifying soundness and trying to identify the most problematic limb. Um, quite often, uh, as we've discussed, the horse will have trauma or an injury or something that's not comfortable in its body and it will compensate by overloading a different limb. So when you're watching the horse move, it, it's sort of chicken and the egg and and your vets and other equine professionals will watch the horse and try to pick um, which is the limb that needs to be treated as a symptom and which is the limb that needs to be treated as a cause. Um, so lameness is an abnormal gait or stance of an animal that is the result of dysfunction of the locomotor system. So there are many horses that, that I see at competition days, for example, that are trotting around and to regular eyes, they don't look lame, but if they're short on one limb or they, they don't stand square, then technically that's considered a lameness. Um, in the horse, it's most com commonly caused by pain, but it can also be due to neurologic or mechanical dysfunction. Um, so things like scar tissue and muscle atrophy all play a pretty important role in how your horse moves and can perform. So. Now we're going to look at some lameness labs and test our eyes to see if you can pick up lameness. Will they get sound from you? Oh, okay. Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're going to play this and see how we go. So um, these lameness labs are on YouTube. Oh, I can hear it. <laughs> So these videos are on YouTube and you can find them if you search for Dressage Hub or Lameless Lab. So we're just going to watch these videos. We're looking for all the things that we've spoken about, the way the horse rocks over the hips, evenness of stride, and we just want to try and pick 
which limb is the issue limb? It's a lot easier in slow motion. If only horses could move in slow motion when I'm watching them in the field. <laughs> so we're looking at the rock of the hips, the, the swish of the tail, or where the horse is holding the tail. We're looking at the footfalls. Is the horse bringing one leg in more than the other? Yeah, Louise. <laughs> Louise just hit stop. Sorry, my apologies. We'll fast forward back to that. <laughs> it's <my life. laughs> Did anyone pick the lameness before the vet started explaining why the limb was lame? Oh. Type your answer in, please. <laughs> and we'll just see if anyone pick right behind. So with the limb limb, the, you'll see the, the hike of right hind. So if you watch the horse from behind, the right rump moves slightly higher than the left rump. Hind limb lameness is quite difficult to pick. Yeah, it is right hind. So Penelope got it right. Congratulations. <laughs> it's tough. So we're watching the right, the white foot. Which makes it difficult as well because the white foot makes you draw into it. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the bet. Oh, we've had some video errors. <laughs> Thank you for letting us know. <laughs> Penny got it right. So that one was a right hind limb lameness. Um, so we'll just flick on to the next slide and we'll see if we can pick the next one. And just flick down here and flick that in. Oh, that's sorry. Technical errors. Let's see what we get. Apologies for our technical difficulties. It's the first time I've tried to embed, embed videos into PowerPoint. <laughs> Let's see what we get. I hope no one has um, epilepsy. <laughs> So the carriage of this horse is quite different to that of the one that we watched previously. You can see there's more action through the head. So 
So let's type into the question box which limb you think is the lame limb on this horse. <laughs> Louise and I are both sitting here nodding our heads in time to the horse. <laughs> I apologise if anyone else has the flickering of the video. We're not quite sure what's going on there. <laughs> Technology is great until it doesn't work so well. This is the same horse moving on a circle and on a soft surface. So the, on a circle, the inside limbs take more weight than, that, than those on the outside. And also the soft surface puts more pressure through the muscles and the soft tissues, whereas the hard surface is more concussive on the joints. Quite often I'll ask to see the horse move on hard and soft surfaces when I'm trying to, to determine whether it's a joint issue that we need a vet or whether it's soft tissue and something that I could work with. So we had one of um, front right. Oh. oh, I think I might have broken it trying to pause it. Oh, sorry, Louise, I'll step away from the keyboard. <laughs> Apologies, everybody. Here we go. For those of you that didn't hear the, the vet's description properly, the horse that we watched on the hard surface and on the circle was lame in right front, right fore. So we were watching the head bob and the head was coming up when the lame limb was hitting the ground and that was right fore. Um, so there's two more lameness labs left. Here's our third one. Let's have a look and see what we can see. Yeah, and this one, Louise and I both agree. This one's quite tricky.
So we're looking over the quarters at the rock of the hips. Is one hind quarter rising higher than the other? We're looking at where the horse places its feet. Is it on two tracks? So is there a plait in the hind? Is it on three tracks? We're looking at stride length. Is the stride on left front and left hind the same as that on right front and right hind? We're watching the movement of the head. Is there an obvious head bob? We're watching the swing through the lumbar. We're watching the movement of the shoulders. Is the same horse on a circle? Soft ground. Is it striding out evenly? Is it using all four limbs equally? Does it look to be favouring one over the other? We're looking at the tail swing. Is it hanging nice and relaxed or is it being held to one side? I don't know if my talking is distracting or beneficial, but I'm just verbalising things that I look at when I'm assessing horses. Louise might have other things she's looking at. No, no. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. And this one's challenging. No one's commented yet with what they what limb they think, if any, is lame. So we're just we're just watching now. And we'll just see. Here's what the vet has to say. <laughs> I've watched this too many times. <laughs> So there were some people that couldn't hear the vet's diagnosis of the third horse we looked at. Um, the outcome was that this horse was sound. There was no obvious um, head bob. They were striding out evenly. There was no uh, hip hike from behind. Um, that the third horse we looked at was sound. Uh, so this is the last lameness lab that we'll look at and then we'll move on to the therapy component.
So for those of you that didn't hear the diagnosis of the fourth horse, he was a standard bred pacer, which explains the abnormal gait, and he was hiking his hip on the left side, indicating a left hind lameness. So that's the assessment component. <laughs> so now we're going to talk briefly about equine muscle therapy. So once um, I've assessed the horse and I, I know what I'm working with, um, and I, I know where the horse needs me to spend most of my time, um, I'll then get into the therapy component of the session. And uh, the purpose of the therapy is to release tension, relax fascia, improve range of motion, increase circulation, ease pain, and just soften everything so that the skeleton can, can realign itself. And at the end of the day, our goal is to improve posture and movement. So the body work that I do is similar to osteopathy or physiotherapy, but for horses, um, most therapists that I know will spend half an hour to an hour on your horse and then not provide any follow-up for you, um, which is great. And your horse might be fantastic for the next week, but then they might revert back to how they were previously and, and you're none the wiser on how to fix it or what the issues are. So uh, my philosophy is we treat the symptoms Rather, uh, we treat the cause rather than the symptoms and I leave you with homework to do so that you can work to improve your horse's posture and movement yourself. Um, so a session with me is two hours long. The first half an hour is the assessment that we've just gone through and then there's about an hour or so of body work where I work on the entire body um, because also in the body everything is connected. All of the, the muscles overlay each other, the fascia connects muscles to each other, the muscles turn into tendons or ligaments depending on where they are um, that activate bones and, and uh, move skeleton. Um, so everything is connected. So I'm not one of those people that will go, oh your horse is sore in the hip and then just focus on the hip. Um, if your horse is sore in the hip, I'll still start at the face and work my way back to the hip uh, because if I just relax the hip, then all of the other muscles that are compensating for that hip issue haven't relaxed and so the horse will, will go back to those learned patterns of compensation and there'll be no improvement. Um, so then the last half an hour is uh, reserved for whatever we need with the horse. If you don't need me, then I'll leave. <laughs> and if you do, then uh, we might do TENS or some kinesiology taping. We might have a look at your saddle fit. We might look at hoof balance. It's basically whatever your horse needs specifically um, while I'm there. So I work similar to that of a human physio. Um, when you go to the physio, they'll assess your range of motion and then they'll work on you for a bit and then they'll send you home with some strengthening exercises. So each horse that I work on is sent homework tailored to their specific issues and if the horse does the exercises, like with humans, rehabilitation is much quicker. <laughs> so I do have some people um, that just prefer to have me out quite frequently to do the work with the horses myself and, and that's no problems but I find that it's more cost effective for people if they have me out and then I give them homework and they uh, make a concerted effort to complete the homework. And then I might have a look at their horse again in another few weeks time just to make sure that everything is um, moving along well and, and we haven't created more issues for the horse and that the level of work that it's doing is adequate for its physical issues. Um, and then I'll give you more exercises and we'll just keep building until your horse has the required strength to do what you're asking of him. Um, so for the bodywork component, I use a range of different modalities depending on what the horse needs most. So no session is exactly the same. There are some horses that really love the deep tissue work and there are other horses that just can't handle it and I have to use uh, techniques that are a lot softer like myofascial release for example. So when there's an issue in the body like trauma or arthritis or a subluxation, uh, uh, chiropractors like to say the horse is out but if a horse was out through the hip, its leg would not be connected to its body and it wouldn't be able to stand up. So <laughs> um, I really don't like the term out. I much prefer subluxated. <laughs> and subluxation just means that the joints aren't sitting together the way they should. Um, and when, if there is an issue in the body, then the muscles will contract around the area to protect it. And because the horse's body is 80% muscle, it's what holds the skeleton up. If there were no muscles, the skeleton would fall over. And that's why when you see skeletons, they're held up with different struts um, and they're all propped up or on a frame or something. So 
um, when when a chiropractor, for example, whacks the skeleton, it might move initially, but if the muscles aren't relaxed enough to allow the movement, the adjustment will be temporary because the muscles will just pull on the skeleton and put it back where it was. So um, through body work, we aim to release the tension and relax the muscles and the fascia, which then improves the range of motion through the joints and lets the skeleton um, gently realign itself back to where it needs to be. Um, and that's the osteopathy part that Louise mentioned at the beginning in, in the introduction. So through working on the muscles we can increase circulation to the area and we can ease pain and usually when I'm working on a horse I'll get a lot of self-adjustment from the horse's skeleton as the muscles relax and allow the skeleton to move to where it needs to be. Um, and it's also pretty important to note that only vets can be qualified equine chiropractic in Australia. So if the chiropractor that you're using is not a vet and he's not a qualified equine chiropractor. Um, in Australia we're a little bit lax with uh, rules and, and professional bodies and it's also very important to note that only vets are allowed to diagnose. So uh, being a body worker I can't come out to your horse and say oh yes it has this injury but I can, I can tell you my opinion of where I suspect there could be an issue and if you want a proper diagnosis then that's when you need to get Louise or a qualified vet involved to do a proper workup and a proper assessment and a proper diagnosis can be made then. Um, so yeah really if you want something definitive then you need to speak to your vet um, and people like equine chiropractors, body workers, muscle therapists, we can all um, improve your, the comfort level for your horse but if you're looking for a proper diagnosis then you do need to see a vet. Um, so equine muscle therapy, I'm not biased either way towards chiropractors or, or muscle work but given that I do muscle work for a living I, I do um, see more value in it than chiropractors. <laughs> Oh, and Louise concurs, so that's good. <laughs> okay, so to be an effective body worker, you need to have an exceptional knowledge of equine anatomy. So a lot of people will look at what I do and go, oh, it's just massage. Um, and on the outside, I guess it, it can be interpreted as just massage, but um, as a body worker, it's, it's very important to know the function of each muscle or group of muscles on the skeleton so that you can be effective with your treatment. So. Body work isn't just a nice massage, um, it's about um, determining where your horse is sore, what muscles it's using that it shouldn't be using, what muscles it's not using that it should be using um, and encouraging the horse's body to relax and uh, start re restart itself I guess and, and train it to move in the correct way with correct posture. So. If a, a massage therapist who isn't solid on equine anatomy comes along and works on your horse, um, as we spoke before about how muscles contract around an area to protect an injury, so if, if the muscles in your horse have contracted to protect an arthritic joint and then the muscle therapist comes along and releases those muscles, it can actually do more harm than good to the horse because the horse is using those muscles as a crutch to protect the compromised joint. So that's why it's pretty important that your therapist is qualified and, and does have a solid um, anatomy knowledge and that they do use multiple modalities and tailor the session specifically to your horse's issues. Um, that, I find the assessment part so critical because it just helps me to correctly identify what your horse um, is feeling and thinking and where it considers its issues to be so that I know which muscles to work on, how much time to spend in each area so that I can get the best result for your horse. Okay, so body work, um, I use that term because it encompasses so many different modalities. So we're relaxing the musculature, we're doing some gentle stretching, we're improving range of motion. So look at the horse's eyes in these photos, uh, they're very soft and relaxed, there's no um, harsh movements or yanking on limbs, it's very, it's working with the horse's body um, and just letting the horse tell me how far it can go, how much is enough, um, yeah, okay, it's all very kind. <laughs> so some therapists will just use their hands but I use a variety of tools and techniques myself and so looking at the eyes of the horses pictured, they're all um, 
pretty relaxed and comfortable. On the left, this is Spirit, and he's using the TENS machine, uh, which is the one I spoke about earlier that puts a little electrical pulse into the muscles, causes contraction and relaxation. Uh, Bo in the middle is a good advertisement for rock tape there, but <laughs> I've put, what have I done here? Oh, I've, he had pole tension, so I've put a fascia release relaxation taping at the pole on the head obliques. Um, I've put a relaxation taping, so that's the pole taping. I've put a relaxation taping through the back. I've put an activation taping over the, the gluteals and biceps femoris, and I've put a relaxation taping up the hamstrings. So tape is a great tool, but it's only as good as how it's applied, and there's many different uses, so you can use the tape to activate muscles or relax muscles, to improve circulation, to relax fascia, to stabilize joints, there's a whole range and it, it depends on how you put it on as to how effective it's going to be. So for example, if you wanted to relax a muscle, you would tape from the muscle's insertion to the muscle's origin, whereas if you wanted to activate that muscle, you would do the reverse and you would tape from the origin to the insertion. And again, this is why your therapist needs a very solid knowledge of anatomy because if you tape the wrong muscles in the wrong way, you can do more harm than good. Um, and then the horse on the right, this is Wyatt Earp and he is having a photonic session. So this is a 660 nanometer light and I'm using it on acupressure points and the, the frequency of the light um, encourages cellular activity and circulation. So the light just happens to be red because that's what 660 nanometers comes out at and red light is associated with healing and um, health, good health and rejuvenation and blue light for example is associated with cancer and that's why solariums had blue light and now they've all been banned in Australia. Um, yeah, so I was very skeptical of that one when I first heard about it because I'm very science based and, and I like people to show me the evidence before I'll, I'll trust it <laughs> and use it. Um, but horses, unlike humans, they don't have the placebo effect. It either feels good for them or it doesn't. And I've had some really good results using these modalities uh, which are more than just feel and hands. Okay, so then after the bodywork component or after the bodywork session with me, I will give you exercises that you can do with your horse. I like to call it homework um, and some people do consider it quite tedious like homework but if you can dedicate the time your horse will benefit immensely. So this leans into rehabilitation. So once we've identified the issues and worked on your horse's body, we then move into rehabilitating your horse to improve core strength improve their posture and their way of moving, strengthen the correct muscles and just help your horse to be more happy and comfortable in itself. So uh, the exercises that I give you are to retrain your horse to use the correct muscles for optimum movement and posture and to train their muscles to better accommodate a rider or better do their job um, and to improve the muscular strength to take the pressure off already compromised joints and this will enable your equine friend to live longer and be happier in himself. So just 10 to 15 minutes a day can make a huge improvement to your horse's health and happiness. Some of the exercises I give you are as simple as repositioning your horse's feed. So um, not all of them are time consuming. <laughs> the two photos on the left have the horse eating in a particular posture that encourages them to stand square in front and behind and evenly weight bear on all of the limbs. And we've also got a lovely stretch up over the top line of the horse, um, especially through the lumbar sacral region. So this stretch is great for horses with pelvic asymmetries as it trains the muscles, the deep skeletal muscles like psoas for example, to straighten the pelvis. Um, so the, the rump of the broodmare that we looked at earlier that had the pelvis tilted to the left, she got this exercise on her rehab. Uh, the two photos on the right show a horse eating its hay high. Now this is a bit controversial, a lot of people think that hay high is a big no-no um, and that horses should be fed with their feed low. Horses are grazing animals and in the wild they'll eat the grass, yes, but they'll also eat trees and shrubs, they'll reach up, they'll grab branches, they'll strip bark from trees. Um, so note the rotation of the horse's head in these two photos. So it's going from side to side and it's suppling its pole muscles and working through that atlanto occipital junction, which is where the skull joins the neck. 
It's also stretching the ventral neck and chest muscles. So that is the, the muscles down the underside and of the neck and into the chest. So this is helping, the retraining these muscles, the ventral neck and chest muscles, is helping your horse to telescope and reach forward for the bit when it's ridden. And lastly, notice how the horse is standing at the hay net. He's almost perfectly square. So this particular horse has sacroiliac joint issues from a heavy racing career, and he's also in quite poor condition. So he's standing close behind because we haven't quite got those sacroiliac um, hind end issues under control, but he's almost square there at the hay net. And so the constant movement of him reaching up to grab his hay and then putting his head down to eat it, chew, swallow, pick up the scraps, and then the nasal discharge is flushing out the dust from the hay. And then he goes up again to stretch and grab more hay, and then he'll drop it down again low to chew and swallow and pick up the scraps. So he's not choking because, well, there's, there's minimal risk of choking because he's not chewing the hay with his head up high. He's pulling the hay out of the net and then dropping his head down to chew. Um, and any of the the dust that he might inhale will come out with the nasal discharge just through gravity when the head is low. So it's the repetitive motion of the up and down with the neck that contracts and relaxes the horse's neck and chest, chest muscles. And it's having to rotate the head from side to side to grab at the hay in the net that softens the pole muscles around the atlanto-occipital joint. So this is a good exercise for pole tension. And the one on the left is a lovely stretch for a pelvic issue pelvic issues. Okay, so next slide. So here are some photos of Ruffy doing his rehabilitation exercises. Hills are fantastic for rehabilitation. In the first photo we've got Ruffy backing up a hill with his head low, which makes him engage his core, lift his back and engage his gluteals. Um, you'll notice if you ask a horse to back up, most often the first thing they do is throw their head high and then go back. That's easier for them um, because they're hollowing their back and they're, they're just charging back and it's quite easy. But if you ask them to put their head low, it makes them lift their back and engage their core and that is quite challenging. So start off with your horse just on the flat and then progress to a slope. And then there are different variations of this exercise um, as your horse develops strength. So walking across the rise of a hill and then zigzagging back down is also very effective exercises for managing sacroiliac injuries. And I've yet to meet a horse that doesn't love his carrot stretches. Um, one of my clients calls out to his human every morning when he feels it's time for his stretching routine, or maybe just carrots. <laughs> so carrots or any treat can be used to encourage your horse to really push his limits and stretch like he hasn't stretched before. It's amazing what bribery can do. So here we're getting Ruffy to stretch up and stretch those ventral neck muscles. And then in the next photo, we're getting him to stretch down and stretch along the top line of his neck and through the back. Um, pole work is also a very effective rehabilitation tool and poles feature in all of my rehabilitation plans. They're just copper's logs that I bought from Bunnings and slapped some paint on. Um, and you can prop them up on bricks or besser blocks or whatever you've got lying around. Um, here, Ruffy is stepping higher over the pole with his inside leg which makes him focus on the inside glute heel and quadriceps more than the outside limb. Cool. So that was the uh, rehabilitation section. If you've got any more information for me on equine assessment, muscle therapy or rehabilitation for your horse, you can check out your website. Um, my phone number and email address is up there. Um, I also have a, a great range of products available and more information on the therapies that I use in my sessions if you're interested. And I'd love to thank Louise and exclusively Equine Veterinary Services for having me along and giving me this opportunity to present to you all. Thank you for sticking around and I apologise for the issues that we had with those embedded videos. If you wanted to watch those again, um, they're just on YouTube. If you search the Dressage Hub Lameless Lab, then you'll get um, those four videos that we looked at and hopefully if you couldn't hear the vet's um, diagnosis at the end, you'll be able to watch that yourself on YouTube. So now we're going to look at some questions. So we have a question from Okay, we have Julie. a question from Julie. 
and what is the cost for your visits? Oh, what is the cost for my visits? Um, because every horse is different, I charge by the hour. So I don't do a per horse rate. Um, so I charge $75 an hour and most sessions are between one and a half and two hours. The first session, the first time I ever see a horse is usually always two hours um, because there's usually quite a lot that I need to go through with the horse um, and owner. <laughs> so, uh, and I also like to spend a little bit more time on the assessment um, and just getting familiar with the horse's movement before I put my hands on them. Um, I do have some horses that I see quite regularly that I do in an hour. Um, so I've just found that the per hour rate seems to work best for most people. So 75 an hour there. <laughs> Next. Do you, do you do proactive treatment, i.e. for a young horse that doesn't have issues? Oh, yes. Oh, I love that. It's starting with a clean slate. It's so much easier to train a horse to move correctly when it doesn't have compensatory issues throughout its body. So, yes, I'm very excited about proactive <laughs> rehab, yes. <laughs> and what sort of, do you prefer just exercises for your proactive rehab? Yeah, so for proactive rehab, I'd still do the muscle work because when the horse is working, um, it's putting the muscles under strain. So it's, it's like with humans, if you've done a big run, the best thing you can do is, is have a rest and then go and have a massage. Um, so it's the same for horses. So I do like to do muscle work with the horses, um, but the exercises I give you will be considerably different because it's about um, developing core muscles and, and building top line muscles and, and encouraging the horse to keep working in the correct frame um, rather than trying to straighten the pelvis or release the tension through the pole or, or fix something that's a problem. Yeah. So I suppose with young horses before they go to the breaker, it would be good to be doing exercises to build their core strength before they go to the breaker. Yes, absolutely. Yes. For those of you that couldn't hear Louise, she just said, uh, I suppose with young horses that are going to the breaker, it would be beneficial for them to be doing the exercises in hand so that they can build the strength to carry a rider before they go to the breaker. And that's absolutely correct. Um, horses weren't made to be ridden they're flight animals and it was the decision of humans to whack a saddle on and ride them. Um, so horses, the back is not weight bearing. The, the back is a suspension bridge between the two the front and hind limbs and, and we need to, if we want to ride the horse, we need to train it to be able to lift the back and carry the weight of the rider um, and therefore use the suspension bridge properly. So yes, absolutely, proactive, um, exercises before we break the horse in or start the horse under saddle is ideal. Teach the horse how to move first and how to carry himself first before we add weight to his back. Now Nancy has a 16 year old American saddle bred and has developed a hunter's bum in the past year. What can I do to help him and what do I, what did I do to cause this? So 16 year old saddle bred with hunter's bum. Yeah, cool. Um, so Nancy, um, just about, oh, probably 97% of the horses I look at are somewhat compromised in the hind end and it's usually around the pelvis um, rather than in the limbs, which is also quite different to vets because most lameness is found in the limb from the hock or knee down. Um, but being muscles, there are no muscles below the hock and the knee, it's all ligaments and tendons and I work on soft tissues so of course I look higher in the horse's body. Um, what did you do to cause this? likely nothing. <laughs> um, the horse, it, it could have sustained this injury just hooning around the paddock and having a slip. It could have just landed on, on its pelvis in the wrong way. Um, it, if it was started under saddle from quite a young age and not taught how to lift its back and carry a rider properly, then, then that can also lead to sacroiliac issues. Um, because the sacroiliac joint isn't a, t a standard lever or ball and socket joint, it's very um, fragile and uh, when the horse is riding with a hollowed back, it's putting pressure through those ligamentous fibres of the, the sacroiliac joint and stretching it and moving the pelvis that articulates with the spine further away from where it should be. So if the horse is ridden in incorrect posture, that can cause sacroiliac issues. If the horse is um, raced uh, from a young age before the growth plates have closed, that can cause sacroiliac issues. 
if a horse has just had a nasty fall in the paddock, um, if it's young and it's had a nasty fall in the paddock, that can cause sacroiliac issues. Um, if there's hock or stifle issues, then then it's pretty much anything that causes the limb not to track straight is putting pressure through the sacroiliac joint, hip joint, stifle joint, hock joint, fetlock joint. So um, what did you do to cause it? Very difficult to say. There are many, many causes. <laughs> Do you find it's more common in older horses as well because they do start to get that laxity in their ligaments yeah. and things like that. So it can, I find sometimes it can just be due to old age, but they're usually yeah. over that 20 yeah. when they get that, but sometimes it, whether it just ages early. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Louise, for those of you that couldn't hear, Louise said, do I find that it's more common in older horses too because they have the laxity through through their back and through their joints? Um, absolutely. When the horse gets gets older and ages and they get a bit arthritic in their joints, then they start moving differently. Um, they might get ridden a bit less. They start losing top line. Um, it's harder for them to maintain weight and condition. So those things all contribute to sacro issues as well. Um, the other question you had. Mari has a question about what is the difference between a hunter's bum and an, an, an Arab's angular bum? Oh. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the difference between a hunter's bum and an, and an Arab's angular bum. So a hunter's bum is trauma and a, an injury to the site and it, it, it gets that peak to it because of the muscle atrophy surrounding that area, um, whereas the Arab's pointy bum, <laughs> um, it's that's usually just the, the conformation, like the shape of the pelvis and because the Arabs are fine boned, uh, it's the way their muscles sit. Um, so sometimes an Arab's angular butt is just an Arab um, and it's just due to their conformation. Arabs also have an extra rib I think too. Yeah, so um, there are a few anomalies in an Arab that aren't standard in other horses. So it could just be one of those anomalies or it could also be due to injury and trauma. Uh, there was a question earlier about what to do about hunter's bump. Yeah, so the first thing would be to assess whether your horse has pain and if he is in pain, then stop riding him because it's putting a lot of pressure through that injury. The second step would be to have a, an equine professional come and look at it and work on him. Um, a vet, yes, or a body worker if you're confident that, that that's what he needs. And then the third step would be to rehabilitate through exercises and, and building muscle strength and correct riding. Um, another question? Another question from Julie. Um, should a horse with sacroiliac issues never be jumped? Um, will this aggravate the issue? Uh, jumping, yes, puts a lot of pressure through the hind end and yes, jumping will aggravate the issue. I don't recommend jumping a horse that has pelvic issues regardless of whether they're sacroiliac or otherwise um, because it's already compromised in the hind and jumping puts a lot of pressure through the hind end. Um, I would not say that it could never be jumped. I would like to see it rehabilitated first and then it could go back to a jumping career. Um, but if it has had sacroiliac issues in the past, I wouldn't be trying to ask it to jump anything more than 60 centimetres after it's been rehabbed. Um, so there's another question. Another question? Another question from Julie and the question is what age do you consider a horse to be to be old? Julie, yeah, you can answer this one, but I, I'm I'm just 40 and I feel old, where my sister is 60 and she doesn't feel old. So it's really variable. Like I went to a horse the other day that was 16 and it had hardly any teeth left, but its 24-year-old um, paddock mate had nearly all its teeth and looked better than the 16-year-old. So it's really variable. Um, we consider horses to be old once they get to about 14 to 16 is, is classed as um, old age, so but Kate might have something to add to that. Um, I consider a horse old when the growth plates have closed, um, so I'm thinking anything over six. Uh, the work that I give horses that are under six is different to that that I give to horses that are over six just because of the, the fusing of the growth plates. Uh, we don't want to stress a skeleton that's still developing. So I wouldn't say old as such, but I would give different mature, mature perhaps. <laughs> I would give different exercises to a young horse, i.e., younger than six, than what I would a horse that is over six. Um, but I do like Louise's description better. <laughs> okay.
Uh, any more questions? These are fantastic questions. I'm having a great time. I think we're about to run out of time. Oh, so. <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. Wow. Okay, so if no one, if no one, um, sorry, if no one has any more questions, um, oh, 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 hang on, um, uh, sorry, we just have a thank you, oh, um, one hock and one hoof. So Nancy was just explaining that her horse has a few injuries. Um, so yeah, thank you. I'm glad we could answer your questions. Um, so we'll leave it there tonight. We are running out of time. Once again, thank you so much for joining me, Kate. Um, it's been very informative and I've picked up a few things tonight as well. So um, like I said, we have um, we have had great success with um, with Kate and, and her um, procedures. So if anyone in our area does need a muscle therapist or a I like to call her an osteopath, um, then please um, grab her number, contact our office or email us and we'll give you her details. But she's extremely thorough and um, we've had brilliant results. So once again, thank you, Kate, and thanks all for joining us. We will see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.